Hello, and welcome to the Work Inspired Podcast. I'm your host, George Lucas Pfeiffer. On today's episode, we feature the Chief Creative Officer and President at Lior Burnett, one of the world's largest and most iconic ad and creative companies. Britt Nolan is here to share with us some insights on creative collaboration, workplace, how to create a long-lasting and iconic brand or ad campaign, and even some fun character stories. Although we had a minor audio issue at the beginning of the conversation with a mic dropping out, you're barely going to notice thanks to Britt's brilliance, knowledge, and all the advice he has to share. Let's kick off this conversation. Work Inspired starts right now. Britt, thank you for being here. Super excited for this. I love your company. Um, I actually considered going to work for your company at one point in my career. Oh, wow. You're such a well-known brand, Leo Burnett and Publicis Group, and i um, really excited to pick your brain a little bit today. Yeah, thank thanks you. for having me. So how does someone become the Chief Creative Officer or President at Leo Burnett? Tell me your professional story. Um, so my professional story, you know, this was, this was never a goal um, of mine, actually. It uh, it just kind of happened, um, and I'll start <laughs> I'll start at the beginning. Um, I was uh, I went to Ithaca College. My major was television radio, mm. and um, and I really loved writing and and directing. And I kind of thought you know I'd just graduate from school and become a Hollywood director, and you know that would be that. But what I realized was that a lot of the kids I was going to school with were going into either like local news or moving to LA and working crew jobs and. And that wasn't that interesting to me. Um, what I found out about advertising, what blew my mind was that I'm like, oh my God, I can make a piece of content that a company with a real budget pays to produce. I get to work with a production company and directors that I admire, and then everybody has to see it. Yeah. And that was really exciting to me. Yeah. Um, so, I, so I started focusing on advertising, went from there to a very small agency in North Carolina, in Charlotte. Um, that's uh, that's no longer around, but it was it was really small. It was like fifteen people, and it was a great place to start, you know, because I got to you know do things that I was nowhere near qualified to do, um, and just get right in and start mm-hmm. learning by doing. Um, I spent about three years there, you know, doing really sexy things like writing final signing brochures and um, you know, like radio spots for a local hospital, sure. and stuff like that. Um, I realized after a few years there that I needed to get to a bigger market, mm-hmm. you know, because it, it, it matters in this industry and people, you know, do move around a lot that you kind of have to, you know, build your career that way. Mm-hmm. So I came to Chicago, um, worked at a couple of smaller agencies, each one just kind of getting bigger and bigger, and came to Leo Burnett in 2009 to work on Allstate as a creative director. So I, so I really focused on um, writing. I, I think it may be worth mentioning, like in our business as a, as a creative, um, it's kind of two primary crafts, there's writing and art direction. And we partner people up in teams. So writers tend to work with an art director partner. Um, myself, I was a writer. And, and, and when I came to Leo Burnett, I came as kind of a copywriter slash creative director on the Allstate account. Um, and, and it was by far the biggest agency I'd worked at. There was so much opportunity. And I just, I mean, I was already in love with it. It's a really fun job, mm-hmm. but I fell in love with like the size and scale of Leo Burnett and the amount of opportunity that was available to me. Um, we wound up doing creating the Mayhem character for Allstate like pretty shortly after I got there, which was a project that I led and something that I ran for the next like eight years while continuing to work on other accounts. But over time, I was our chief creative officer left, and I had kind of organically found myself in a position where I was running. A number of the biggest accounts in the agency, and one day they came to me and were like, hey, um, would you do this job? <laughs> and it terrified me. I mean, it really wasn't, if you had asked me, you know, two years before that, like, would you ever want to be a chief creative officer? I was like, God, I don't know. Mm. I don't think so. Mm. You know, it wasn't, um, it just wasn't on my radar. But I, but I stepped into it, that was in 2016. And um, yeah, I mean, it's like, not a not a boring day passes, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. I'm sure. What for those that aren't in the ad in, you know industry, how does a chief creative officer compare to a chief market marketing officer? Is it uh, is it a similar role? I clearly you work with a lot of creatives. 
So kind of what is that? What does that job entail? Yeah, similar. I mean, a chief marketing officer is uh, tends to be our client counterpart mm-hmm. right? and mm-hmm. the senior most person on the on the client's marketing team. Mm-hmm. Um, they oversee much more than just creative. Mm-hmm. You know, they're looking at the entire marketing strategy, media, pricing, everything. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, we do spend a lot of time working with strategy and working closely with clients and doing things that might not you know, appear creative, but mm-hmm. my primary responsibility is the creative product of the entire agency. Okay. Um, and so as a creative director or a chief creative officer, you're really focused on, you know, how, how do I get to a great idea that's going to be effective mm-hmm. for our clients, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And we're going to unpack that a little bit yeah. too in this conversation. But let's talk about Leo Burnett kind of as a whole. Mm-hmm. A lot of us are familiar with your organization, but... What would you say makes it unique? What makes Leo Burnett special outside of what you already, you know, it's, there's scale there. It's a large organization and capacity to move around and grow your career. Yeah. Um, but what, what makes people want to work for Leo Burnett? There's a lot that makes Leo Burnett special. I think one of the, one of the big things, we just look at it like from a macro level, is it's, a, it's an agency with real heritage, right? We were started in 1935 um, in Chicago. The only global network headquartered in Chicago, which is, which is kind of cool. Um, and you know, we've got a, we've got a great legacy of, you know, this is an agency that created like some of the most iconic, you know, advertising characters and campaigns Mm -hmm. in American history from Mm -hmm. like the Jolly Green Giant to the Marlboro Man to the Pillsbury Doughboy to, you know, Tony the Tiger, um, you know, and, and there's something cool about that. Like there's something that, um, you would find in our culture, people have, they take a lot of pride in being a part of this, you know, iconic Chicago agency. You mm-hmm. know, when, you, when you have relatives come to town and you take the architecture book tour, they call out the Leo Burnett building, right? right? And your kids are like, is that where you work? Yeah, yeah that's where I work. Like right. it's, it, you know, it's, it's cool. It's got a, um, kind of a, a mystique to it and a, you know, some, um, I think there's a real respect there. We talk a lot about, and I, and I steal this from, uh, from Bob Iger's masterclass episode when he talks about running Disney, but we talk a lot about um, respect versus reverence. And he talks about that with, with Disney in that, you know, if you have reverence for the past, you can become frozen in time, mm. right? Um, and it's a challenge of running a legacy mm-hmm. company where you can, you can say, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do exactly what Walt Disney was trying to do or what Leo Burnett was trying to do. Instead, we try to have respect for it and mm-hmm. appreciate what Leo Burnett was trying to do and appreciate that our job now is to build on that mm-hmm. and keep it relevant and take it into the future and not um, be kind of paralyzed by that by that reverence. Um, so one of the cornerstones is this kind of legacy, which I think is, is, is really beautiful and fun and brings us a lot of pride, you know, kind of mandate to keep that modern. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, while it's not uh, I think our work has changed a lot from the days of the like Jolly Green Giants mm-hmm. and Pillsbury Doughboys, but we still do um, really excel in creating brands that stand the test of time, mm-hmm. you know, and resonate with kind of like mass culture. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, things like Allstate was a client for a very long time. I mentioned, you know, mm-hmm. Mayhem earlier. Things like that, that in a modern way kind of do take off and become a part of the cultural zeitgeist. Mm-hmm. Um, like our term is populist creativity, but that is, I think, one of the things that you know keeps us special, which which has a lot to do with our geography. Mm-hmm. A lot of the um, you know a lot of the agencies that are hot are on the coasts, and that's cool. Like you know, New York is a very like fast moving, trendy, you know, globally minded place. Um, but it can also create kind of a bubble. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things about the overnet is that we're kind of just naturally in touch with what regular folks are thinking about dealing with doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love that about it, right? Like we're, we're at the intersection of like a, a major cosmopolitan city, but in the middle of the country, you know, so I think that's a thing that, you know, makes us a little bit unique. Is that kind of reflected in your organizational culture? You know, the Midwestern, Values the I mean, obviously there's the iconic brand and I love how you position that that there's a responsibility to kind of live up to 
the past, but but not be stuck there. You know, to be forward thinking. What is the culture like? How do you got? How are you guys working? How do, how are you like? When when someone comes in, if they're not saying, "Oh, I'm going to work for Leo Burnett because Leo Burnett's the best," then I'm going to work for the best. Right. You have to sell somebody on coming to work for your company because they're top talent. What do you tell them? <laughs> oh man. Well, I would tell them that the same thing that worked for me, which is about the amount of opportunity that's mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. What's interesting about our business compared to a lot of industries is we are extremely talent focused. Mm-hmm. Like our only inventory is people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, agencies can talk a lot about proprietary tools and, you know, uh, unique ways of, of working and seeing the world, whatever. At the end of the day, the secret sauce is talent. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, as a leader in a creative company, it's critical to create an environment where people, where talent can thrive and where mm-hmm. they want to go. And what they want really is, is opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, to do work that is going to build their careers, but also to grow and learn. And, um, and so that's kind of like the primary thing. So as a, you know, I think our culture reflects that in that um, we're, we're much more collaborative than many businesses, mm-hmm. right? Like, I mean, I think all agencies are, but this is very much a team sport. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and in order for it to be so, you got to create a place where, you know, people get a voice, they get to come in and, you know, express themselves and really be a part of things. Mm-hmm. So like, I, I always find culture is a, it's a really hard thing to talk about. Right? Mm-hmm. So you're recruiting somebody and you're like, here's what our culture is. Mm-hmm. Like, you kind of sound like you're full of it. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, because culture is like all the things that are hard to talk about, yeah. all the things that become invisible to you. But when I step outside it, I do think that is different about us. Well, I think if you can layer that in with exactly what you said earlier, you felt like early in your career, you kind of had to move around. If you can find the ability to move around within one organization through Leo Burnett, that's huge. Totally. You're also working on some great brands. So portfolio building is, is there. Yep. You're also working with great talent. So mentorship and training and development yep. is there. Absolutely. And then you, if you can put on top of that, or generosity, you know, uh, people enjoy working there, even though it's competitive and competitive industry. I think that's a winning, you know, that totally that would sell me, you know, and, I, you know, and you hear that reflected in people a lot. One of the things I was most surprised about when I first came to this company was the amount of tenure mm. there. You meet a lot of people that are like, yeah, I've been here for 20 years, 15 mm. years. And if you're looking for a growth opportunity, you can move from one account to another. It can feel like you've worked for a number of different agencies. You really don't need to mm-hmm. jump around. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also interesting for us being so big and in a market that is, it's a big market, right? But it's not nearly as big of an advertising market as New York, mm-hmm. let's say. Mm-hmm. Not as many places to recruit from. Mm-hmm. And Leo Burnett at its best has been known as a place that's a great t- training ground. And mm-hmm. I think like that's like the value exchange, right? It's like, am I... I mean, take a step back. Like I, I think one of the important questions we're asking ourselves, and I think everybody should be right now, is that in an age where you can have a, a very gig career, a very, you can be an independent you know, contractor, why would a person work for a company, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I think the answer has to be because when you work full-time for a company, they don't just care about your yesterday or today, they care about your tomorrow. Mm-hmm. They care when we, we're buying into you, mm-hmm. right? And we, we're buying into your potential and we care about, you know, what you can become and, and, you know, how we can be a part of that. Whereas if you're a freelancer, you know, I'll hire you. If you deliver for me, I'll hire you again. If you don't, I won't. Right. I'm not, I'm not, right. I'm not betting. On you're not making an investment in that person. Totally. Right. So like we have to be a place where, you know, people come and we offer them that variety of opportunity, you know, ability to learn and grow or else we don't have any future and our talent is our lifeblood. Mm-hmm. Right. And are you currently working in at, in your office? Are you guys in a hybrid model? What's kind of the current? In, I guess I'd call it a hybrid. Okay. We're in, we're in three days. Three days. Okay. Yeah. It's, that's fairly, that's what a lot of companies have. I mean, that's become three. normal. Yeah, yeah. Our, our point of view on it, it, it was a really interesting process thinking that through. Um, for a while, we were two days mm-hmm. and we tried like two flexible days. We thought about, you know, three flexible days. What we realized is that the idea of an office is only, all it is is a promise that you'll be there exactly. if I'm there. Yeah. And there's nothing that drains your energy like, you know, making a trip in from, you know, we were talking about earlier, we, two hour yeah. it's like come in and you're not 
there. Right. You know, then why did I come in? So we agreed that if, if the office is just a promise of other people being there, we should all be there on the same base. Mm -hmm. And um, and that has, I think that's worked. I think people have kind of felt that reward of mm -hmm. like, you know, it was worth my time to come in. Mm -hmm. So we so we go three days. We, we work from home on Mondays um, and Fridays. I'm a big in-office person, probably annoyingly so. I just find it really distracting to work at home, and I, I get my energy from being around other people. Mm -hmm. um, but I, but even I, like, don't want to come in on Fridays <laughs> ever. Again. Yeah. Yeah. Fridays at home are pretty nice. <laughs> After you've had that, at least three days that week, you're ready to take. Now get back in the car on the train. Yeah. But yeah, but we completely agree. We we're in the business of building workspaces and, and a place is nothing without the people. And and that was one of the challenges people had, especially as we came out of the pandemic, was you know, people were being incentivized to come into the office, but if but but because of the talent situation, there was it was harder to mandate, but people some people would show up and they'd say, Well, I'm the only one here. Or there's only yeah. 10 other people here and it was a bad experience because even if the workspace is incredible yep. without the people in it it's it's not gonna it's not gonna yeah. be a valuable experience so yeah do you do you find that the, the space itself as far as encouraging collaboration encouraging creative thinking is that important does that play a role do you is the does the design does the do, do you know what you put in the space does it support the ability of those teams to be effective when they are in those three days a week? Yeah, I mean, I think it has a massive impact. I mean, I'm not, I, I also won't say we've got it perfectly right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it seems to me there's an opportunity to now design a workspace that's like, you know, we're in, we're in kind of a best of both worlds mm -hmm. world now, right? Where like you can have all the benefits of flexibility and you can have the benefits of being together. Mm -hmm. Even if everyone's in the office, every day, every person has some meetings where someone isn't right. in the office. Right? right. And and that can be hard to, you know, we're in a pretty open floor plan. We've got a bunch of breakout rooms. Mm -hmm. um, we probably don't have enough breakout rooms. It's hard to like focus on your creative work when the person next to you is on a, you know, video call right. and vice versa. Right. Um, so I think there's some optimization to be done. Mm -hmm there's this thing of creative teams. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the ideation happens with two people having a conversation, right? Like, you know, work looks a lot like sneakers on a desk and, mm -hmm. you know, two people staring at the ceiling, like mm -hmm. thinking of ideas. That's also kind of hard to do when you're like in the middle of a hubbub, you know, and mm -hmm. our breakout rooms used to be used for that kind of stuff. Like, I'm just gonna grab my partner and we're gonna go talk. Mm -hmm. Now they're like full of people on calls and then you know, mm -hmm. video conferences. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, you know, we make it work. Like people definitely, um, you know, they figure out how to make it work and where they need to go to work the way that they want. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you can also in our building, like, you can move all over the go to a different floor, mm -hmm. or, you know, someplace else. But I'm interested in like what the ideal mm -hmm. workspace is for how we're doing it now because I've not seen that anyone's totally cracked it. Yeah. Um, well, that's because you layer in all this flexibility and choice, and it is. It's calibrating the right, the right setup and the right basically processes for whatever team it's trying to support. It used to before the pandemic. There's a lot more rigidity of control, even in open, open floor plans. It was a real estate play, mm -hmm. you know, like how much what's your yeah. square foot per person. And in your industry, the the creative industry has always been a little bit more open minded about flexibility and, and choice, even before the pandemic. Absolutely. But yeah. you're right now. There's there is this need to bridge remote and in-person teams like there's never been before. Yep. And so acoustical privacy, visual privacy, you know, like how do you quickly move in between these different meeting types and work styles? Yep. It's definitely at the forefront. So yeah. do you find though that uh, with your clients, you know, you pitch big, big ideas, big campaigns. Is that something that before the pandemic you were doing frequently through a video call or was being in person together with a client? important it was for big presentations with clients it was it was always in person mm -hmm. um, before the pandemic mm -hmm. and now we push for it to be in person mm -hmm. as much as we can mm -hmm. um, you know but it's but it's a mix both agencies and clients have more and more workers that don't live in the city that mm -hmm. they are right mm -hmm. so like it's not just like hey clients in Atlanta we're in Chicago we're gonna go from Chicago to Atlanta it's like yeah 
but someone on the team. Like everybody lives in different places, yeah. and, and even if you get to the client, they might not all be. Um, so sometimes we are still having to do it hybrid, but um, but we used to do that in person. I think in person for creative meetings is very important mm. um, because on video conversation doesn't flow the same. Mm -hmm. One person gets to talk at a time while mm -hmm. everybody's kind of waiting to speak. And you can't read body language to say, you've got a point of view. What is that? I, I noticed you, you want to say something. Right? Sure. I, I found that people, fewer people get to have a voice mm. um, in, in bigger meetings that are virtual. And, and creative work is messy. Like the, mm -hmm. you know, that's one of the, I think, fundamental characteristics of it is that there's not as much of a process as people want there to be. And a lot of it is like smart people in a room talking, mm -hmm. probably for longer than you think they should in conversations that are more swirly than you think yeah. they should be. And like, you need that environment for it to be messy. Mm -hmm. And video is just not that great. Yeah. And it's also very structured. It's very scheduled and totally. linear. And the nice thing about an in-person meeting is there's serendipity. There's unplanned interactions. And that's a lot of times where innovation and creativity stems from. So 100%. obviously have a, um, a track record and so does Leo Burnett of creating great ideas, great campaigns. And as you said earlier, that stand the test of time that can be delivered at scale that reach a large number of people and maybe even culture and at large mm -hmm. is there a, is there a strategy for that is that just something is that a skill that has been developed and that you guys hire for and train for or is it i mean i'm not saying tell me the secret sauce <laughs> but like how do you approach the idea of creativity at scale and 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 coming up with ideas that that time and time again are winners right how do you do it? Um, the hard way, I think. <laughs> the hard way. Um, you know, it's a. I mean, it's a, it's a hard thing to describe, but I'll I'll attempt it. I mean, when I say the hard way, I mean by generating a lot of ideas. Mm. Um, so lots of failing before you get to success. For sure. Yeah. And a lot of waste. And I think I. I I actually think like one of the things culturally that separates agencies from our clients and one of the reasons that we can do things that they can't do is our kind of tolerance for waste mm -hmm. and inefficiency mm -hmm. in the process because a lot of it is like we're going to have a lot of ideas. We're going to bounce them off each other. We're going to see what, you know, makes us feel something or that somebody's like, oh, that, you know, that feels big. I can, I can work with that. Mm. You know, a, a, a big test for me is sometimes when we have like a big, either like brand platform idea or campaign idea to get jargony. If the creatives working on it mm -hmm. are easily able to like generate a lot of ideas, if the, if the idea itself brings energy into the room mm -hmm. and it inspires the people working on it, that's great evidence that we're onto something. Hmm. Um, anytime it feels hard, hmm. uh, it's probably not a great idea. So a lot of it is that kind of gut feel when we're talking about like how to, you know, I guess I feel kind of corny saying this, but like create hits mm -hmm. as it were. It's mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of it is just kind of trial and error mm -hmm. and like, you know, well, this seems cool and it feels big. And there's five people who were like, oh, my God, I want to, you know, I, I, it gives me ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we often say when we're presenting to the clients, like in terms of evaluation criteria, like does it make you start brainstorming? Mm -hmm. Right. When you hear an idea, are you like, oh. I can immediately think of 10 things I could do with that. It's hard to describe exactly what that is, but um, but you know it when you feel it. Mm. Um, you know, things just kind of generate. <laughs> I like <laughs> that because you guys have had that success, so you know what it feels like. You know mm. what you're looking for. As I'm not a, I'm not a musician, but I often think like, how do how do artists know when they've got a hit on their hands as they're right. writing music? You know, mm -hmm. maybe it's that they had some success in the past. Maybe that first right. one's challenging. You're kind of taking shots in the dark, but yeah. But once you've had success, you've got a model for it. Yeah. And so it is, a, it's kind of a feeling, right? And yeah. And you know, there are kind of phases of a creative process, right? There's, there's like generating and there's editing. Mm -hmm. And when you combine those two things, you stifle creativity. You mm -hmm. kind of, you can't over edit or try to be too correct when you're in the process of coming up with things. Mm -hmm. However, we are constantly studying what worked mm. and 
and talking about why it worked. Um, we make a lot of case studies. Like our industry um, is big on awards competitions, mm -hmm. and usually this and usually always. The submissions are in the form of like a two minute case study video that tells the story of, you know, here was kind of our business or human challenge that, you know, the strategic spark and which leads to the idea and then showing off the execution and the results of that is like a basic like bones of a case study. We are constantly watching what's like performing well in award shows, learning from other people's case studies, mm -hmm. talking about them then looking at our own too you know because because we'll often have to when we present our creds to clients we'll show them you know the work we've done yeah we have to talk about why we did it and why it worked and that process of like constant critique and analysis of what has worked hones your instincts for being able to recognize what's good in the moment mm -hmm. you know what i mean so you're not rationally editing so much while you're creating but but the constant process of learning and critiquing gets you, it builds a muscle mm -hmm. where over time you get better at recognizing, you know, ideas that might go somewhere. Are you surprised often? Or at this point, are you fairly certain when you've got an idea before it launches that it's going to be a success? Um, no, I'm, I'm <laughs> this is maybe the wrong thing to say. I feel like m more often I'm surprised when something's not like, mm. I, maybe that's like overconfidence, but like, and, and, and yeah, for sure, I've been like a number of times surprised at how big a thing mm -hmm. gets mm -hmm. um, or, or when something takes off. But, but I tend to be like so optimistic. I'm like, oh, this is great. <laughs> and then like, you know, um, and not in an arrogant way where then like when it is a hit, we're like, yeah, I knew it, you mm -hmm. know, because um, there's for sure there's surprises there. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, I, but I feel like, um, I don't know, like most agencies are generating like a lot of pretty good stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yeah. and like it's uh it can be hard to predict why some of it takes off and some doesn't yeah and how and 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 is it possible i mean clearly there's a lot of ways now people that people experience content and, mm -hmm. and brands and messages right yeah more so than ever and there's yeah. consistently an increase in opportunities to do so right with yep. social media and um you know ai now and the digital space is are you able to separate out something that is maybe going to be a trendy thing or, you know, a short lived hit versus something that will, you know, stand the test of time? Um, do you design for that initially? Or like, do you go into a campaign and say, we want something that's going to live for a decade. Right. Or, or in another case, we want something that's going to be a flash in the pan. Right. Do people, do you have those conversations with your clients or is the goal always to stand the test of time? No, it's, I mean, I think one of the fun things about our business is that like the, the goals, I, I won't say different every time, but, mm -hmm. but there's not like one thing that we're trying to do every mm -hmm. time. Um, you know, sometimes like you do want to like take advantage of a cultural moment in time and mm -hmm. do something that will, you know, hit a huge spike and resonate with something that's, you know, that's very timely and mm -hmm. that can be really effective, you know? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we are looking for a more enduring idea or or more of like a um, a, 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 a big long term brand platform. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's important that we're clear about that at the onset. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of confusion can happen when, you know, we're looking for a big enduring thing. Mm -hmm. And but the kind of ideas people are bringing are, you know, quick, you know, flash in the pants. There's not really a right or wrong. It just sure. depends on what you're trying to do. I mean, definitely. Whether you're doing quick hits or not, we're, we are always trying to make sure that everything we're doing is 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 building on a bigger brand idea, mm -hmm. right? So when we're we we are very intentionally trying to to build brands that last for a long time, mm -hmm. um, and and where everything that a brand does contributes some meaning to mm -hmm. that brand, and that there's intentionality to that being a part of a of a bigger story that we're building, um, if that makes sense. It makes but, a lot of sense. Yeah, the so, brand needs to stay, needs longevity. Yeah. Nobody's like, I want to have a brand for one year, right? right? But an ad campaign could be a month long. It could be. Yeah. And okay. sometimes, and speaking of things, you know, surprising, you know, um, I mentioned Mayhem earlier and not to overplay it, but that was meant to be like a, a one quarter campaign. Oh, it, was, really? it was like, we need a Q4, you know, 
value campaign hmm. and you know something to compete with geico's you know 15 minutes could save you 15 okay. percent all state hadn't hadn't been as effective as they wanted to in advertising like that they've got you know mm -hmm. lower prices and a better value than you think so we came up with that we thought it would be 13 weeks worth of work and it stuck and you know we kept with it mm. and i'm really grateful for it right because sometimes when you're thinking too long term mm -hmm. you can get really precious and responsible mm -hmm. and talk yourself out of making interesting decisions whereas there's some freedom in saying look like we're, we're going to make five spots here yeah. and like, we'll see how they go. And then we'll, we'll take it from there. I, I think there's real beauty in that. And then paying attention to, Oh wow, that worked. Let's do more of that. Yeah. And I was just going to say that could be another ingredient to the success of longevity is take something that's working and grow that. Right. Yeah. Expand that. Totally. Idea. Yeah. I, you know, we often will get briefs for something that can last a really long time, but, um, but I've seen it be a real limiting factor in, you know, uh, having that expectation of every idea mm -hmm. because it forces everyone evaluating it to just, you know, again, like you get really responsible. It's like, well, if this is going to be our thing for the next 10 years, it's got to be perfect. You can't take and, risks, right? And it can't, like yeah. you can't, there's so much about this that like you can't know um, going into it. And you have to kind of discover along the way and you mm -hmm. got to stay a little loose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. Now, you talked a little bit about some of the iconic mascots that Leo Burnett's been responsible mm -hmm. for. Are those ever short-term plans? Or is a mascot something more like a logo that's probably going to, you plan for it to be around for a while? You know, like, that, I, I, I am not familiar with what makes a mascot successful. Yep. I am familiar with all the mascots that you listed. Yep. Uh, I guess first, yep. are mascots still a thing that people are actively developing? Um, I think so. I mean, it depends, you know, like everything, it depends on your category, it depends on your objectives sure. and what you're trying to go for. Um, mascots, if you think about it, and if, and, I'll, and we can like lump characters in Character, under that term, sure. but, um, but you see them like a lot in insurance, mm -hmm. you know, the category that doesn't have a, um, a physically visible product mm -hmm. and you need to create a memory structure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, putting a face on it, um, is really helpful for people to, you know, have a mental shortcut to think about yeah. it, which is why, you know, you've got, I mean, Progressive has multiple characters now and Liberty Mutual has, you know, the Limu Emu mm -hmm. and Geico's mm -hmm. got a gecko and they had cavemen mm -hmm. and they had, you know, the hump day camel. And, yeah. you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of mascots and characters in those kinds of categories. And I, and I think they're really effective. It's also linked to in a lot of ways like your media plan mm -hmm. because developing a, a character or a mascot um they work really well in 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 video you mm -hmm. know in moving media mm -hmm. right if a thing can you know walk and talk and express a point of view um it's gonna stick and if there's some frequency mm -hmm. to that um, a lot of those ones i just rattled off are just big TV advertisers mm -hmm. and they do a lot of commercials. Mm -hmm. um, it, so, so I, I feel like on the whole, we've probably seen fewer characters because advertisers aren't making TV such a heavy part of their mm -hmm. mix anymore. Not, not to mean that you can't develop a character in social. I mean, you know, most of social media is like highly video based. Yeah. Um, but I, but a lot of those characters that I rattled off, like they're old school because they were from a time when you'd make a series of commercials and everyone, you know, had mm -hmm. to watch them if they wanted entertainment. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so I, I they think they had to become memorable. They right? had to, yeah. you know, it was like, you know, everyone was, uh, everyone was watching the same stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's less of a tool than it was. Yeah. I think part of what's interesting really now is, um, I think audio is more important than ever, mm. um, which I think has a lot to do with why TikTok is so powerful, mm. you know, because mm -hmm. it's basically an audio based medium and tra and sound spreads really well. Mm -hmm. You know, like mm -hmm. I don't as compared to an image, I, you know, I can I can put the same piece of audio on many pieces of video and mm -hmm. create something unique every time or I can 
I can sing a song, I can reproduce it with my voice, I can tap it out on the table, I can, there's a lot of, or, or even like a line, yeah. you know, like if there's a catchy line or a joke mm -hmm. um, in a piece of work, you know, um, like Dilly Dilly a few years ago, right? That mm -hmm. becomes something that like, anyone can participate, it's, it's, it couldn't be easier to participate with, mm -hmm. and it spreads like wildfire. Is that that's an interesting, you know, idea that you bring up is that you compare a TikTok, you know, the the popularity of trends on TikTok, which is interesting from an ad perspective that they're, you're using pop culture music, you know, and mm -hmm. layering it often over video, you know, short video content, yep. and you compare that to traditional TV ad campaigns that feature uh, a character, you know, yep. and they're very, I mean, they're very very different, mm -hmm. so. For Leo Burnett, that's known for great character, creative, you know, campaign ideas. Are you guys looking at how do we how do we move some of our creative output into that new world? Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, and is that has that been a challenge? Is it a shift in thinking, or is it just a different platform, but the same principles kind of apply? I mean. No, the same. I mean, there's there's some of the same principles, but some different principles. Yeah. I mean, the the. I think the challenge has come in, um, you know, just everybody developing like new muscles and instincts and yeah. not just us, but our clients as well. You know, the kind of work that they're asking us for, uh, the way that we're evaluating, mm -hmm. you know, what a good piece of work should look like and what it should do. Um, you know, there's like always, you know, kind of building on best practices, mm -hmm. you know, for any medium and, and just getting people aligned to those. And again, like agreeing what, great looks like yeah is a is a challenge when you know things are always shifting but um but you know it's um i don't know it for us it's it's it, it's been exciting you know yeah. like our thing is like it's just like stay curious about you know what's the best way to make brands matter to people and mm. how to connect with people and um and it's fun to be reinventing it all the time mm -hmm. you know like mm -hmm. there's nothing more boring than just pumping out TV commercials as much as I love them. And like, you know, it's a great medium. Yeah. Um, we're much more motivated to explore and try new things than to, you know, do the same sure. thing over and over again. Do these new opportunities make it easier or more difficult to reach a large number of people from an attention perspective? You talked about awareness at scale or the societal cultural yeah. impact of some of the campaigns that you guys have done in the past. Is that easier today or more difficult? Um, both. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, it's easier in the sense that, like, things can spread more mm -hmm. easily. And it's something we think about a lot, you know, to some of your earlier questions, like, when when crafting an idea, we talk a lot about, like, how, how can we, you know, engineer this to be able to spread? Like, mm -hmm. what, what does it need to be like to be something that's got the maximum potential for taking off? When you hit that, things can take off like never before mm. it's harder because there's um no two people's feeds are the same mm. right so so there's fewer kind of mass media that we're all consuming we're all reading different things like your your, your media diet and like what what is influencing you is so personalized that mm -hmm. you know it's not like um you know the days where like you turn on the tv and if we're all watching you know, the Tonight Show, we're all going to see the same commercials. The only time that really happens anymore is like live sports, yeah. Um, yeah. award shows, like big yeah. live events. Um, but, you know, so it's it's kind of both. Yeah. You know, but it's interesting. Like, I think one of the kind of tricks to work that takes off is um, like, is it something that someone wants to attach their identity to? Hmm. Right. Like. In social, it's not so much about like what you say to someone, but but what you're giving them to say about mm. their self, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And a few years ago, Leo Burnett did the Always Like a Girl campaign, right? Very simple mission to change the meaning of the phrase, like a girl. A lot of people really want the world to know that they agree with that message. Mm. And so when you put that out, even though it was just a piece of video content, so many people are so motivated to kind of pin that banner to their chest mm -hmm. that it spreads like crazy and mm -hmm. it becomes something much more than a piece of video or much more than a TV commercial ever could have been. If, you, if you've got the right match, like it's very easy to start a brush fire. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. I mean, like the, the, obviously you've got traditional KPIs for measuring success, but 
it seems like some of these these new channels or new ways to do, deliver a message or a campaign present opportunities to have more, even more meaningful engagement than just a view, you know, or just a, totally. uh, maybe a conversion. So that's yeah. cool. I like that. One of the things that we, we talk to leaders from all different industries and, you know, and a lot of, a lot of companies are looking for ways to be more innovative or more mm-hmm. creative or more collaborative. Some of the things that you guys specialize, specialize in. Yeah. Any advice, any advice for leaders that say, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to move my company forward. I want to, you know, better my brand. I want to make my teams more engaged. Yeah. I don't know how. Hmm. Probably several things, but I guess I'll, I'll go into, you know, what, what works for us is like in a very basic way, like I think a lot of it is about, you know, like listening and learning. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we're set up for innovation because we are so collaborative Mm -hmm. and because so many, like if you have a point of view, you have an opportunity to bring that into the work. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just one of the things I find constantly inspiring is like, if you're, if you're kind of curious about where things are going, you're always trying to, you know, um, learn more and challenge yourself and whatever. And you're allowing others to be involved in that. um, I think you're setting up conditions for, for innovation um, and inspiration. Because I think like so much of it is about like talent being emotionally invested, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. in, in what you're trying to do and, and, you know, getting the most out of people. Mm. Um, I think requires kind of that openness. Mm-hmm. The other thing I'd say is like, I guess at the root of that is curiosity. I, I heard a, I wish I could cite the source. I, I did not make this up, but I heard a great podcast um, where they made the point of you should build your career around a problem, not a technique. Mm. And that really resonated Mm -hmm. with me. Meaning, you know, if your problem can be, I want to cure cancer, that's a really juicy problem. There's a lot of ways to tackle that. A technique can be, I'm an amazing researcher. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and in, in, in our industry, it's like, you know, your technique might be, um, writing or crafting advertising, but what's the real problem you're trying to solve? Mm-hmm. You know, if you can focus on like the problem is I, I, how does a, how do brands matter to the most people, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. or how do I entertain people or, you know, whatever that may be, then there's so many ways to tackle that. And it forces you to always stay curious about, you know, what are new ways that I can attack this, you know, big, juicy, yeah. you know, basic problem versus, how can I spend my career honing a craft or a technique that's always at some point, like the more expert you become in that, you can become limited in a yeah. lot of other ways, you know? Especially if the technique technologies, they advance, they change. One day you're, you're totally obsolete. Yeah. Right. Very relevant to today as well with what's seems to be here and coming quickly through mm-hmm. AI and some of the changes in, Totally. Disruptive tech, which we've talked about in almost every episode so far this season. <laughs> yeah. Top topic. Uh, that, that was a, that's great. I we ask every uh, t- towards the end of every interview, we ask kind of each leader, is there something that that has been useful for you in your career? A resource you just mentioned a podcast, book, mm-hmm. group that you could recommend to others. Lots of little things. I'm a big skimmer. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. read a lot of books, but don't finish them all. Yeah. Um, I. I mean, one that I particularly love as a book is Creativity Inc., mm-hmm. um, written by Ed Catmull, who you know was president of Pixar, mm-hmm. and uh, and there's just so much in there that's so relevant for anybody. You know, I think in any business, but in particular a creative business, mm-hmm. and he, you know, his understanding of you know like creative culture, a culture of excellence, even like the m- merging, you know, Disney and Pixar. Mm-hmm. Like, there's so much in there that I found really inspiring and useful that's a good one but i don't know i have lots of little sources i'm a big master class fan yeah um, yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah some good stuff in there, there and is. it seems like you're modeling you're looking at people i mean you mentioned eisner you know you like there's there's a lot there's a lot of precedents to look at to say this is what success looks like in a creative space or in an innovation you know space and i think if like you said if you're curious about it 
yeah. you can get a lot of insight from what people have done before you know, yeah. and, in, and insight into what's coming. Is there something you're excited for in the next 12 months? Could be personal or professional. Um, gosh, everything. Everything. I don't know. <laughs> a lot. I mean, I, I, I'm glad you took the pressure off the AI topic because mm -hmm. um, it does seem to come up in every conversation, mm -hmm. but it's hard not to cite that. Mm -hmm. um, I had a meeting with someone yesterday in our company who's just tinkering with a lot of tools and, and really blew my mind with you know, all the things that we could be capable of doing and all the ways that we work that mm -hmm. can change. And I'm like, it gave me a lot of energy to be like, mm -hmm. oh my God, like it, it'll be so fun to play around with, you know, how we incorporate more AI and, yeah. and change the way we work. And my, my fear is like, are people gonna be adaptable enough and, mm -hmm. and not afraid to get into it? But, um, but I'm really eager, like I think in a year, the conversations we'll all be having about AI will be very different conversations than we're having right now. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm excited to see what happens, Yeah, you know? Well, if you're a company that likes change and challenge, mm -hmm. you're gonna have a lot of a lot of energetic conversations, I think, because there's a lot of it coming. So yeah, uh, yeah that, that, that makes sense. I, uh, our final question is always kind of a mentor to mentor type of a thing. If you're gonna retire tomorrow, <laughs> What's some advice you'd leave for your team? Um, for my team, I would, I mean, it's a theme I guess I've touched on a, a couple times in this conversation, but I would say stay curious. Stay yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I think adaptability is the, is like probably the most important quality mm -hmm. in talent right now. Mm -hmm. And um, if, if you try to cling to the past, like you're dead. Yeah. So you just got to stay curious and keep learning and don't be afraid of it. The reflect reverence idea. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Well, incredible insight. Obviously, you guys are doing some amazing things and uh, excited to follow you and what your teams are doing because I think there is a lot of change ahead. And, and it's not surprising that you're excited for everything that's going to be happening <laughs> yeah. uh, because there's a lot that's happening. So totally. thank you so much, Britt. This has been a wonderful conversation. I can't thank you enough for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been fun. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, please take a moment to rate our show. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the Work Inspired podcast so that you don't miss any of the incredible guests we have planned for upcoming episodes. We'll continue to find the best and brightest minds in business so that you can learn, grow, and succeed and so that we can all work inspired. Work Inspired is brought to you by BOS, a leader in commercial working environments and a Hayworth best-in-class dealership. Experience our 360 approach and discover the team, tools, and techniques required to navigate the complexity of your next workspace at BOS.com. If you have ideas, feedback, or would like to be featured on our show, please email podcast at BOS.com. Thank you for listening. This has been a Workspace Digital production. If you're interested in launching a podcast at your organization, please email info at workspace.digital for a free consultation. Oh,